today. I am happy. I'm having a great day. This is one of the best days of my life so far. Why, you look like you don't believe me. <laughs> Amen. God is so good and his blessing never fails. And I will trust in him till I die. One of the first songs I ever remember, Sister Rosetta Tharp singing, goes back a long time before y'all, was I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord till I die. Well, I'm not going to die. I'm going to live. Amen. I shall not die, but live Amen. and declare the works of the Lord. Amen. This is a scripture from the Bible. It says it, and I believe it. Everything belongs to God to use however he wants to. A lady uh, had a daughter that fell out in my church service in St. Louis, and um, she fell into a coma. I don't know what was wrong. They, I don't know if they ever diagnosed her. But they rushed her to the hospital from my church service. It was, uh, you know, that embarrasses a faith healer <laughs> when, when the ambulance pulls up and runs off with somebody. <laughs> and all the churches on the avenue there on the boulevard, they were all, well, what happened at Brother Ross's church, you know? Well, the truth is, uh, they rushed, and they never found out what was wrong with her. She was about 14 years old. And she came to me that night, and she, uh, the mother did, and said, what am I going to do? I said, here, take this bottle of anointing oil and go in the hospital and anoint her forehead with oil and say, in the name of Jesus. Say it three times. And so she couldn't get in the next day, and she couldn't get in the next day. But on the third day, Maybe there's something significant about the third day. But she went in and anointed her daughter's head, who was laying in a coma, and immediately, she said, in the name of Jesus, nothing happened. In the name of Jesus, nothing happened. But when Jesus came out of her mouth the third time, her little girl got up, or woke up, her eyes opened, and she said, Mommy, where am I? And, uh, you know, the reason I'm telling you this is because... People no longer believe things like this happen. They don't believe it anymore. Therefore, it doesn't happen for them. God is not working with people of unbelief. God works with people who believe. Can you say amen? No wonder they don't get any miracles. They don't believe God for miracles. No mystery to me here. Well, how come miracles doesn't happen in my church? You don't believe in miracles. I read it right here. You believe in other things. The reason you haven't received your miracle, maybe you ought to examine your belief system and begin to believe again. Believe with God all things are possible. Anything can happen. When you pray in the name of Jesus, there is power in the name of Jesus. You say, well, what if it doesn't happen? And I say, what if it does? Amen. Why are you on the negative side of this? I believe God wants to do something. Everything belongs to God to use. Often, God has deliberately chosen. And I like that word deliberately because the word deliberately is used many times in the Scripture. Only the thing is, they don't translate it. But in uh, Philip's translation where it says this in 1 Corinthians 1, 27 and 28, it said God has deliberately chosen certain things. And here are the things that God has deliberately chosen. God has deliberately chosen foolish things. Well, that doesn't make any sense, Dr. Fauci. God's going to choose foolish things? to confound the wise and the mighty. I don't know about you, but I don't take advice from anybody that believes we descended from monkeys. Amen. I don't care what he's saying. I don't believe it. The truth is, child of God, God deliberately chooses foolish things. Foolish things to confound the wise and the mighty. Who are the wise and mighty in this world? God chooses foolish things to make them look foolish. Can anybody say amen on that? 
God hath deliberately chosen weak things, things that are weak to confound the strong. God chooses weak things to make the strong people look foolish. Amen. I always like that one cartoon where the guy went up and tripped Arnold Schwarzenegger and he fell on his face. They cut it out of the movie. I don't blame him because he's supposed to be strong, but a little boy tripped him. Amen. Do you see what I'm saying? Sometimes God deliberately chooses the weak things to bring to naught the ones that are strong. And number three on this list here, God has chosen base things. If you don't know what base things are, base means disgustable, disgusting things, things that are so beneath your contempt you wouldn't even honor it by being contemptuous of it. Well, God chooses base things to confound those people that are just too snooty for heaven. Hallelujah. I hope you all uh, suck this up just exactly like a, a Hoover Deluxe today. Everything I'm saying. Hallelujah. <laughs> Do they even make that anymore? Amen. That was one of my grandpa's sayings. Amen. Uh, God wants you to uh, realize that he can use base things. Some things are base. What would be base in my opinion? It's when Jesus spit in the street dirt and made a little clay out of it and put it in a man's eyes. Nothing more base than spit. You know, I've, I've seen people roll up their sleeves and fight until blood was flying because somebody spit at them. Amen. I might have been guilty of doing that myself. Amen. In another day, in another life. <laughs> but spit is disgusting. Amen. It, it's all right when it's in your mouth, but don't share it. Hallelujah. <laughs> don't share it with anybody. The thing is, that's a base thing. And what is worse? I don't know if anybody here has ever been in a street like in Jerusalem even today and they scour it every night they go out in those streets and they got big washers that wash everything down and it goes into the sewers but in the day of Jesus they just let all the dirt pile up out there and uh, dirt disgusting dirt dirt from people's feet dirt mixed with other things you can imagine what it is because they drove their sheep right through there the thing is child of God that was dirty dirt Anybody got me there? Hallelujah. Not only was this dirt dirty, but it was dirty dirt. Amen. There are dirty things in this world that are despised, and they're base. We think they're uh, beneath contempt. But the Bible says that God has deliberately chosen base things. Why? To make all of these rich and powerful and mighty people look like idiots. Well, he says something else here. He also chooses things which are not. Things that people can't even see. People that, things that they don't even know about. Let me tell you some things that the government doesn't know about. They don't know about the power of God. They don't know about my need for Jesus. They don't know about my need for church. They don't know uh, how I got here. Uh, they're mad at me in Roseville because I'm even here. They don't even want a church here in this building. Can I tell you something, child of God? I didn't come because of them. I came because God sent me. Can you say amen? I ain't leaving until God gets rid of me. Hallelujah. You're going to have to, uh, anybody else going to have to drag me out of here kicking and screaming. Hallelujah. I'm not giving up. And I, God sent me and I'm doing what God said. But here, God chose foolish things, weak things, base things, things which are not unseeable things to bring to naught the rich and the mighty. I don't know about you right now, child of God, but I want to explain something from my standpoint. There is us, and there is them. And if you ain't one of us, you're one of them. Can you say amen? You either, huh, you, <laughs> otherwise, it, it, take the blue pill. Hallelujah. <laughs> Neo, hallelujah. I, I took the red pill. I'm awake tonight or today. Aren't you? 
Listen to what God has used in the past. Exodus 4, 3. God used a rod, a walking staff in the hand of Moses. 1 Samuel 17, 21. God used a stone, five smooth stones in the hands of David to kill a giant. God used a cloak, a coat called a mantle in the Bible. 2 Kings 2.13 uh, for Elijah to give a double portion to Elisha. Uh, God used a spear in the hand of Joshua. He pointed it at a city and God gave it to him and he didn't even throw the spear. He just pointed it. Uh, a handful of salt in the hands of a prophet of God. It turned bitter water sweet. I've drunk out of that well. That spring that is still there, still flowing. It's flowing in Jericho, on the north side of Jericho. It's called Elisha's Spring. You go there, it's the sweetest water you'll ever taste. I used to, I, I, I used to go in there with gallon jars and, and uh, put, you know, bring it back with me because the water was so good. But it at one time was briny water, salt water. God, a handful of salt made the bitter water sweet, the Bible says. God used a rooster. Oh, let your mind go now. Where did the rooster come in at? Uh, the rooster preached to a backslidden apostle, a disciple. He preached to him. Jesus told him, he said, that rooster is not going to crow three times before you deny me three times. And it happened. God used a rooster to do that. Amen. Mark 14, 72. A donkey. And, you know, i got to call your attention to this. He preached, this donkey preached to a backslidden prophet named Balaam. Can prophets backslide? This one prophesied for money. You know, woe unto all these prophets prophesying for money. You got a $10 line, a $20 line, and a $100 line. Amen. Somebody said, Brother Ross, I only have $10. Well, will you think he'll pray for me? And I said, yeah, he'll pray for you a lot faster. <laughs> <laughs> then that one just gave a thousand amen so you get ready for it if you're buying a prophecy my god don't buy a ten dollar one <laughs> go all the way How, if you're going to pay for it you ought to get what your money's worth the truth is this prophet named Balaam was hired go out and prophesy against this these people and when he was going along God sent an angel in his pathway and the donkey turned around uh, he smote the donkey. He didn't see the angel, by the way. The prophet didn't see the angel. The donkey saw the angel. And so he smote the donkey, and she, and she wouldn't go. I know it was a, a she donkey because it said, she said to him, hallelujah. She said, why have you smitten me these three times? You idiot, can't you see there's an angel standing right in front of us? Well, I added a little bit to that. But God used a she donkey. Numbers 22, verse 23. A whale, Jonah 1, chapter 1 through 4. God used the story of a whale. Uh, God created one. God prepared a fish. God made a special fish, and it swallowed uh, Jonah to get him in the will of God. God used pitchers and fire on the inside, Judges 7, 20, to bring deliverance to Gideon. Are you getting the picture here now? how God uses a variety of things. And uh, Judges 15, verse 4, uh, in the hands of Samson, Samson uh, tied fire uh, to the tails of foxes and turned them loose and set the barley fields on fire with, using a fox and firebrands. Uh, God used a jawbone of an ass, Judges 15, 16, for Samson to slay a thousand Philistines. I've had people repeatedly tell me that ain't no big deal. Well, I got to tell you, uh, you go out and try to kill one Philistine. You'll find it ain't that easy. They're tough people. But he killed a thousand of them with the jawbone of an ass. Mark 6, 30, uh, Jesus multiplied seven loaves and five fishes and fed a multitude of people. Five thousand were fed. Spit in mud in John 9, verse 6, to heal a blind man and open his eyes. God used the water from the pool of, of Siloam 
John 9, verse 7, to open a man's blind eyes. God, in the hands of Paul, used handkerchiefs and aprons in Acts 19, 11, and 12. And he sent them to the sick. And not only did the sick get healed, but if they were possessed with a demon, a devil had to come out of them. I know preachers can't even cast out a devil. And here Paul's handkerchiefs were casting out devils. Come on, say amen. Jesus said, take up your bed and walk, John 5, 8. Uh, there's seven trumpets in Revelation, the eighth chapter, that are going to happen in the last day. God's uh, used a pillar of fire in Exodus 13, 17 to stop all of the Pharaoh's army until they got through the Red Sea. God used a pillar of fire and a cloud by day. He used smoke, Exodus 13, 21. Uh, in the uh, last day, God said the moon was going to run down in blood and it was going to be a sign. The sun was going to stand still and it was going to be a sign unto us. Neither one of those things have happened yet. So we're not in the day of the Lord. When the sun stands still and it does not move anymore and the moon does not run down in a different color, when the moon runs down in blood, then you're going to know we're living in the last day. God used mustard seeds, Matthew 17, verse 20. In Mark 11, 12, he used a fig tree to prove that he had power over uh, all the power of nature. He used serpents in the Bible. In Numbers 21, verse 9, that be raised up in the wilderness, and Moses said, all you have to do is look, and you'll live and be healed. And people wouldn't look. And they died in the wilderness of snake bites. I got news for you right now. God can use anything he wants to. God can use sticks and stones and even dead men's bones. Because Elijah, when he put his mantle upon Elisha, he said, you're going to receive a double portion of what I have. And you know, Elisha did exactly double. Well, minus one while he was alive. And where they buried Elisha, his dead bones there at, at uh, Mount ne uh, not Nebo, but uh, uh, in Hebron, where Elisha was buried near the cave of the prophets, where he was buried there. Somebody got killed, and the soldiers opened up his tomb because they didn't want to take time to dig another one, and they threw this dead man in on top of the bones of Elisha, and God raised him from the dead. That made 14 miracles. Elijah did seven, and by that, dead men's bones God did the 14th miracle God keeps his word sticks and stones and dead men's bones and God has used every one of these things you say brother Ross doesn't this cause a lot of confusion and don't a lot of people uh, criticize you for believing like this yes they do I was in the Philippine Islands in uh, Davao uh, Davao is uh, where Magellan, the Straits of Magellan, where uh, he f sailed through there and Cook later. And while I was preaching and I uh, had all of these worthless, no good preachers sitting on the stage that didn't believe a thing I was doing because they had been there, you see. They had already preached there. And they knew that nothing that I said was going to come to pass because they had already tried it. But I'm going to tell you something right now. I don't care if people try it a thousand times before you. If you do what God says, God's going to do what you ask him to do. Doesn't matter how many people tried and failed. I have people all around me who are trying and failing. But can I tell you, you don't have to fail. Don't listen to them. Listen to God. Amen. Listen to God. Let God tell you what to do. If you'll do what God says, God is going to give you the result that he promises to you. Be blessed and know that I'm telling the truth. But I prayed for people. I mean, I had all kinds of miracles happen. But, you know, Davao was an interesting place because uh, Davao was almost as bad as Cotabata City where I had preached and they stoned me and ran me out of town. Oh, that's not in my book. I left that part out. Brother Ray, I didn't want to tell anybody they stoned me and ran me out of town. But that's what happened. And they did run me out of town with death threats. They said they were going to kill me. The police got involved. They came to the hotel and, uh, in Cotabata City. And uh, they, I said, well, I'm not leaving. I got a meeting. 
And they said, no, you're leaving right now. We're not going to have any incidents. The Moros. Moro is another name for Muslims, but they were there. Uh, they were had threatened. They put a, uh, what do they call that? A fatwa. And I said, well, that can't be for me. It'd have to be a skinny twa. <laughs> Not a fat one. Amen. Because I was skin and bones back then. And uh, the thing is, uh, they, they took me and they made me leave. And uh, they got, walked me out to the airport, put me on the plane, flew me to Davao. And so I just announced, I got on my radio station in the Philippines, and I announced that I had moved the meeting to Davao. I was at the Insular Hotel. Come and see me. And so there I was. And here all these preachers that knew I'd been kicked out, they all came out to gloat and see what was going to happen to me there. And they all sat there on the stage, doubting. And uh, I said, okay, I don't need this. I'm going back home. <laughs> and so I told them, I said, I'll be here until Friday night, and then I'm gone. And then uh, you better get here and get, I'm going to pray for everybody Friday night. And uh, at the end of that service on Wednesday night, as I walked off the stage, a limousine pulled up, and there was a man got out of the back, and he was wearing a turban on his head. And uh, he got right in my way. He said, you left Cotabata City. I said, yeah. He said, but you didn't heal my wife's ears. I said, what? He said, spit in her ear. course all the preachers you know they saw the limousine they saw money and so they all ran over there I'm surprised the platform didn't turn over they all ran over there to stare and I said oh god they're going to really do me in now what they've said about me is nothing compared to what they're going to say now if I spit in that woman's ear and I said oh, oh, oh well I said I'll pray her pray for her he said no I heard you preach that Jesus put spit and mud in a man's eyes and God opened his eyes I said, yeah, that's in the Bible. He said, spit in her ear. And <laughs> I thought, I, <laughs> how am I going to get, Lord, how am I going to get out of this? <laughs> and, you know, those, the, guy, the guy that was driving the car stepped out, and he had a machine gun strapped around his neck. You know, in the Philippines, it was like the Old West, only on steroids <laughs> down there. I mean, they were really serious people. And uh, I'm standing there, and, I, and he said, staring at me, spit in her ear. He told me about five times. And so I figured there was something wrong with her ears, and, you know, she was deaf or something. And so I said, okay. <laughs> in the meantime, uh, James Isagiri had pulled a car up there close, and I said, no, uh, do this. Ow, I'm gone. You know, <laughs> I'll be right out there. And so I tilted her head over. Oh, no, no, huh? I didn't do no little spit. I went harking. <laughs> Mother Lewis, you put a, she had to clean up the restrooms at the fairground, and she put a great old big sign up there that said, No harking and spitting. <laughs> so I harkened. Amen. I mean, I went down deep for this one, and I filled both her ears up. I mean, I just really did it. And he's looking at her, and I made my escape. I ran and got in the car, and Brother Isagiri said, wait, let's see what happens. <laughs> I said, James, get out of here. Get this car in gear. Amen. If, <laughs> see, I was great, I'm a great man of faith. Hallelujah. I had faith. But you know what happened? That woman began to scream as loud as she could I, I guess as loud as she could because it didn't look like she was holding God healed her ears I spit in her ear now listen don't think there's anything in my spit that makes anybody get healed amen that's not what this point is about here you have to learn how to believe in God does anybody believe in God here today if you believe then anything you have at hand God can use that to bring a miracle to you. Can anybody say amen? amen? 
Paul said, well, hey, I ain't got time to come and pray. Here, take this handkerchief and lay it on him. Well, handkerchief ain't enough. We need more. Well, here, take my apron and lay it on him. And you know something? God healed people through those. These were based and despised. I don't know what was on his hanky. I imagine he used his hanky like we would use our hankies. Amen. And the apron had to be dirty. But God healed the sick through that. You need a miracle. You need a, some faith for a miracle in your heart. Remember that all things belong to God. God can use anything he wants. God can use anything you have in your possession right now to bring a miracle to pass. He is only looking for one thing, and that is that you believe in him to bring a miracle to you. Can you say amen? amen. Can God work a miracle? The answer is yes. yes. How he does that sometimes can be through you. What you do. Amen. You need a miracle? Well, I, I, I'd never preached this before, Richmond, California, but I was... 20 years old I was preaching for A.A. A. Allen in a, a morning service and uh, a man came up to me at the end of the I preached on prosperity and uh, we had I don't know how but I mean we had a lot of people there in Richmond California and nowadays you can't get anybody to go to church there if you announce a Christian church service they bomb you amen that's the result of higher education in America in, in California anyway and so here I was, I was preaching, had a big crowd, and a man came up here because I just asked everybody, it was the first service, I just asked everybody, bring your best offering and put it in here. And he came down there, and he reached in his pocket, and he had some quarters and a fuzz out of his bottom of his pocket. <laughs> and he said, well, I'm going to give it. He yelled out real loud, I'm going to give it all, Brother Ross, and he dumped it in, lint and everything. Then he came up to me and he said, do you think God would give me a financial miracle? I just gave everything I had. And I said, yes, why not? If you believe him, you keep his word, you do what he says, he's going to bring a miracle to you. And so I shook hands with him, got lint on my hands, right as I shook, amen, prayed for him. And he went and got on the bus. The way he got money for the bus, you know how he got it? He borrowed it from me. <laughs> well, I gave everything I had in the offering, Brother Ross. You got a you got dollar and a half for the bus? And I said, okay. So I, I'm dumb. I gave him a dollar and a half for the bus. And so he goes out and gets on the bus. He uh, knew the bus driver because all he did was ride the buses day, day in and day out. He had no job, nowhere to go. And uh, as he was sitting uh, or getting ready to sit down right behind the bus driver, God spoke to him the first time in his entire life. God spoke to him and said, don't sit here, sit back there. The last seat. And you know, they were having riots over in San Francisco about riding the bus. <laughs> so he didn't want to sit in the back of the bus, but he went back there and he sat down and he didn't notice it. He was sitting up kind of high in, in the seat. And he said, well, I've never sat back here before. I guess that's the way the seats are, you know. And if he had looked out the back window, there was a man running as hard as he could to catch that bus. But he didn't catch it. You know, he's had, getting ready to change buses, and he said, boy, there's something wrong with this seat. And he looks around, and here is a briefcase. The man running, that he had left his briefcase on the bus. And he said, well, I better take this up to the driver. And a voice of God spoke to him the second time in his life and said, don't take it to the driver. You keep it. And so he sat down there and popped the things on it. It wasn't locked, and the thing popped open. And it was full of money. I mean, bundles and bundles of money. So he closed it real quick. He got off the bus at his apartment. He went up on the third floor where he lived, down in South Oakland. And when he got up there, you know, he looked both ways to see if anybody had followed him. 
and he goes in there and he opens it up and counts it. There's $5,500 in cash. Nothing else. $5,500 in cash. And he said, boy, you know, Brother Ross was right. He said God would bless me, and here it is. And then he started counting it again, and then a business card fell out. <laughs> and he looked at it. Now listen, everything belongs to God. It said, whiskey a go-go. The guy that owned it, whiskey a go and That was a big thing in, in California at that time. Uh, they were go-go clubs and uh, served booze, and they had rock and roll music and, you know, weird stuff and all kinds of stuff. Whiskey a go-go. And so he held that card in his hand for the longest time and said, God, this, this money will get me out of here and it'll answer. I can go back preaching again, everything. And then his heart touched him and God spoke to him again. He said, call this man. And so he called him on the phone. And he said, uh, sir, and called his name. He said, if uh, you can tell me what's in this briefcase I found, I'll bring it to you. And he said, there's $5,500. And he said, yeah, where do you want me to bring it at? So he said, bring it to my office. And so here he goes. Now listen to this. This is how the story develops. You know, you make one decision, one decision, just one, one decision, and then it opens up five or six possibilities from there where you'll have to make other choices. So he didn't have to go. He realized, I didn't tell him my name. I don't have to go do this. I didn't tell him my name. And so, uh, but his heart got the best of him. And so he went and knocked on the door. Listen, this guy wanted publicity in the worst way, the club owner. And so he had a guy from the Oakland newspaper, Oakland Tribune, with a camera. And when he walked in there and he handed that briefcase to him, they took his picture his picture was in the newspaper. They wrote a story that said, Surprise, Oakland, California has one honest man. There he was in the newspaper. The next day. I mean, they got busy on this. And when the guy was walking out, you know, he shook hands with him and the owner. And uh, the guy thanked him. He said, uh, Look, I'm going to give you a few hundred dollars. And he said, Oh, you don't have to do that. It, I mean, unless you really want to. And so... <laughs> <laughs> he gave him he gave him two or three hundred dollars in cash and he said well this is a blessing thank you so much and he said by the way what do you do he said well I'm a preacher he said well where is your church he said well I don't have one right now he said you don't how can you be a preacher without a are, are you listening to me he said how can you be a preacher without a church he said I'll tell you what I did my main uh, uh, business down here, I bought a church and turned it into a disco. I have another one that I haven't worked on yet. Here's the address. It's right out there where you said you live. You go there and here. And he got out of his desk and he had the deed. He signed it. He said, I'll give this to you. You go there and build a church. The man walks out of there on cloud nine, 300 bucks in his pocket, and a deed to a church. So, man, he went, uh, is this getting good now? Amen. And so he goes, and he looks in, in the, uh, the church, and it's a beautiful building. I mean, it's uh, one of those brick buildings with spires. It goes up this way with a bell tower, and it's got steps up from the street, and it's headed up there, and it's got steps up into the church and here he's got the key and the deed and the doors were painted red and he goes up there <laughs> that means it's an Episcopal church he went up there and he uh, unlocked the door and pushed the door open and there was nothing in there <laughs> there wasn't even a floor he looked up there wasn't even a roof he said no wonder he gave this to me he was getting rid of it and now it's my church and so he's sitting there saying, well, what in the world am I going to do? He sat on the steps. And why, this gets better. While he's sitting on the steps, are you with me now? While he was sitting on the steps, a man in a, in a suit carrying another briefcase walked up to there and said, you know anything about this church? He said, yeah, it's mine. 
<laughs> I got that deed right here. He said, the mayor wants to talk to you. He said, why? Is there money owed on it or something? He said, oh, no, nothing, nothing like that. The mayor has a proposal for you. Now, he's only had the church for an hour. Are you listening to me? Huh? He's had the church for an hour. Now the mayor wants him. And so he brings him down to City Hall, goes into the mayor's office, and while he's sitting in the office there, the mayor comes out and said, oh, he said, we have been trying to find out who owns that building for a long time. And uh, uh, listen now, this is good. And he said, well, I haven't owned it that long. And so, okay, uh, uh, what do you take for it? And he says, well, Mr. Mayor, how much would you give for it? He said, well, we're getting ready to put a, th a freeway there. 280. It's going to come right through there between your church and the freeway. We've got to clear out that whole area there. And yours is going to, we need that building. We need it real bad. He said, well, what would you give for it? And so they worked out a deal. He said, well, the city has set aside $280,000 to pay for that building if we ever find the owner. He said, where do I sign? The treasurer comes in with a check made out to him for 200 No, don't make it out to the church. Make it out to me. <laughs> well, why not make it out to your church? Well, I don't have a name for it yet, but here, here well, go ahead and take. And then the mayor steps back, and he, this, this, he told me all of this now, uh, the, the guy, the preacher. He said, I saw you. I, I know you. He said, well, you may have seen me in the paper. My picture was in the paper. And they said, well, yeah, I know you. You're... Oakland, California's only honest man. He said, yeah, that's what they said about it. He said, you gave a, a man back a briefcase with money in it. He said, yeah, that's true. He said, well, now you don't have a church. What are you going to do? He said, well, I'll try to find something for this money. He said, don't bother with that. We're widening a place where uh, you go to Treasure Island over to San Francisco from Oakland. It's a big, we're widening that turnstile. There's a church sitting right there. We were going to widen it that way, but it, the, uh, the engineers told us to widen it, on the, widen it on the other side. You know, there at that place, you know, there's like uh, 40 <laughs> turnstiles that you go through and people taking tolls to go over because you have to go over the Treasure Island Bridge and Treasure Island and then the, uh, uh, the Oakland Bridge on into San Francisco. Now listen, we have this church we bought it the same way I bought yours. He said, but we're not going to use it. I believe the city will just go ahead and give you that church if you have a church there. He said, well, I'm your man. Amen. And so he goes over there, gets the keys to it, signs the papers. They turn it over to him. Now he's got a church that's worth a million and a half dollars. He's got $280,000 to live on and, and pack the church. You think that was a miracle? I do too. God used nothing. He, what did he do? He sat down. Can anybody here sit down? Amen. If you can sit down, God can give you a miracle. I believe God will do it. I believe God will do it. God will do something exactly like this for you. He'll make a way. Bow your head and pray with me right now.